What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Nara and Uzumaki? Part 5. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Era, they passed out after just two? I smirked, shifting my gaze to the mentor. Why yes, it seems, not used to it, she nodded distractedly, surveying her sleeping charges. Yep, she herself has quite a bit under her belt already, considering the four empty bottles and one half full one in front of her. Well, for her size, she has a decent alcohol tolerance. With my weight over 90 kilograms, a couple of liters won't do anything to me, especially with resistance to various poisons. So, should we stay a bit longer or head out? I raised an eyebrow, questioningly. Let's stay. I H haven't had a decent drink since I took your trio, so I deserve it. Kanade muttered immediately. Better get a couple more bottles from K for us. I th think that'll be enough for today. All right, let's stay then, I sighed, getting up and heading to the counter. And why do I have a feeling I'll have to escort everyone home? Receiving a respectful look from the man and paying for the sake, I headed back. Dragged her brood here and thinks she can brag, I caught a snippet of conversation passing near one of the tables, thinks that since she got the Tokubetsu Jonin rank so early, she's now out of the weaklings? As shameful to the clan as ever. Turning my head, I spotted a couple of Hyuga from the main branch, judging by their looks, probably at the Chunin rank. Hmm, seems like Sensei's got some issues in the clan, especially with such a weak Byakugan. Well, not my business. Pushing aside what I heard, I unloaded the sake at our table. The drinks have arrived. Well then, let's toast, the Kunoichi declared, grabbing her half. While I wasn't looking, she managed to finish off the fifth bottle and the remnants of mine. I don't mind, under the influence of alcohol, I relaxed a bit and found the situation amusing. Ah, I'm tired of teaching, the mentor confessed to me after a couple of cups, you're a decent guy, but, these two, what about them? They lack the same determination, and without proper training, no one will let our team out in the field because of you. Because of me? I was slightly surprised, leaning in closer with interest. How am I involved? Ah, uh, you're too valuable to the village to let you perish on the first B rank, the mentor waved off, so let's drink to a swift return to the field, even if it's not expected for another year. Hmm, that explains the presence of the Umbu on our mission, which I sensed right after leaving the village. Turns out, he was keeping an eye not on Tsum, but on me. Seems like someone doesn't want to lose such a valuable asset as myself. Not bad. It means we'll have backup from one of the experienced shinobi further on, and if necessary, they can pull me out of a mess since an umbu order surely exists for that. But I need to gather more information while I still can. Sensei, who orders, hmm? Unfortunately, I didn't get to complete my thought. Noticing the kunoichi, I found that Hyuga was quietly dozing off, resting her head on folded arms on the table. Darn, she's already drunk. It's hard to keep up drinking kegs with me as equals. Sighing, I shook my partners awake and made sure they weren't going to wake up. I shook my head. I'll have to escort everyone home. Luckily, during this time, I learned who lives where. True, it will be inconvenient to carry all three, but where there's a will, there's a way. Well, looks like you'll have to trot on all fours, I addressed Karamaru, who was stirring in Tsum's pocket. Or do you prefer riding on my head? The puppy looked at the floor, wrinkled his nose at his owner, and assertively barked. Well, on the head it is, I shrugged. Grabbing the dog by the scruff, I landed him on my head, then hoisted one carcass after another onto my right shoulder and held them with my hand, securing them with chakra for safety. Now it's just the mentor's turn. Only they didn't let me bypass the table, a somewhat tipsy couple Hyuga blocked the passage. Any problems? You, Aburame, leave this disgrace to us, we'll take care of delivering her to our quarter, 
smirked the guy who was a bit ahead of me in height. Considering she lives outside the clan? And I don't quite like his smile. Thanks, but no need, I can handle it myself, I politely declined. There's no point in souring relations with the main branch of the Huga clan unnecessarily, if they keep insisting, it's their own fault. You didn't understand, we're not offering, spoke up the second guy, get out of here now. Idiots. Connecting my shadow with the nearest guy was a matter of a fraction of a second, after which I made a grappling move with my left hand and pulled sharply towards me. Mimicking my movements, the Huga grabbed his companion by the neck and headbutted him soundly. Not wasting time, before the pair could recover and realize what had happened, I pointed at each with a glowing green finger to their foreheads and watched with satisfaction as their bodies slumped to the floor, unconscious. What did you do to them, unexpectedly nearby, Key asked, holding quite a hefty club with an ironclad end. Hmm, the mentor must be quite respected here, judging by the approving murmur among the surrounding shinobi. Just knock the idiots out, I shrugged with my free shoulder, they'll wake up with a hell of a headache by morning. Nodding understandingly, the bartender returned behind the counter, and I stepped over the bodies on the floor, hoisted the mentor onto my second shoulder, and left the bar. Outside, the last colors of the day were fading, so I decided to quickly disperse the sleeping trio and head home. The closest were the Inazuka quarter, so that's where I headed. Across the rooftops. All that was left was to rejoice in my control over chakra, unaffected even under the influence of alcohol. Stop, who are you and what's your business here? The gatekeepers appeared next to the clan gates just as I landed from a nearby roof. Delivering bodies home after a drinking session. I cheerfully reported to the guy and the girl, while the puppy on my head nodded in confirmation. Kuramaru, the kunoichi was surprised, looking up. It's Tsumsama, her partner echoed, eyeing the bodies on my shoulders. Uh, I think I'll call Tsubame-sama, suddenly nervously spoke the Inazuka. So, you're not taking this body away from me? I clarified with the guy, noticing the retreating kunoichi. Sorry, but I won't deliver Tsumsama to her parents in this condition, life is still precious, the guy shrugged and glanced at the clearly amused dog behind him. So what about Tsumchan, a woman's voice sounded from beyond the gates, followed by the appearance of the owner herself with a huge black dog by her side. Surveying the tightly knit Inazuka in a simple white dress and barefoot sandals, appearing to be just over 30 and bearing a striking resemblance to my fellow teammate, I assumed she must be her mother who, incidentally, looked quite attractive. Yours? I raised an eyebrow, shifting my right shoulder. Tsumchan? What's wrong with her? The woman fretted, but after a couple of sniffs, grimaced. I see. So you're her sensei? At the instantly chilled tone of her voice, chills ran down my spine, but I couldn't help a quiet snort of barely restrained laughter. Suddenly, very pale guards swiftly backed away, while the puppy comfortably lounging on my head began to tremble and whimper softly. Even the two healthy dogs tucked their tails and quickly moved aside. And what did you hear that's so amusing, sensei? Ignoring the intuition screaming at me, I made a brief dramatic pause for greater effect. Well, only the fact that the sensei is on my other shoulder, I announced and burst into laughter at the amused face of the senior kunoichi. On your other shoulder? Tsum's mother repeated in astonishment. So you're not her mentor, but a genin? Exactly, and right now I'm escorting these weaklings home after celebrating our first completed C-rank mission. With a groan, Inazuka buried her face in her hands. Sunk so low, already throwing myself at genins. I heard murmuring just within earshot. Well, these things happen, I chuckled. Ryokuen, right? She asked, after straightening up and giving me another careful once over. Oh yes, you have a Hyuga as a mentor, don't you? Anyway, thanks for bringing Tsumchan. Considering there was no one else available, it was no big deal, I waved off, nearly dropping the mentor, take them off my hands and I'll go deliver the rest home. Still, thank you. It's late now, but next time drop by for a visit, the clan's doors are always open to friends of my little girl, Sabami shook her head, taking her daughter from the guard and then removing the puppy from me. Given my small stature and the need to stretch to reach her head, I unexpectedly got a very very attractive view down her dress neckline. Well, my teammate still has a long way to go before she's like her mother, more like we could call ourselves competitors at best, I corrected. Oh really? 
I heard something else, Inazuka suddenly smirked conspiratorially. Something about a monstrously strong and pleasantly smelling Nara sitting next to me in the squad, eh, was all I could manage to say at such unexpected news. Yes, yes, and Tsum also likes tall and strong boys, the Kunoichi size were literally sparkling with barely contained laughter. She's teasing me. Well then, I better get out of here before I hear anything more embarrassing, otherwise Tsum will definitely kill me, I muttered, shaking my head. Nice meeting you, and all the best. Bowing in farewell to the grinning Inazuka pair, I quickly retreated towards the nearest roof. As they say, from love to hate is just one step? Count me out of that. Besides, I'm permanently on Tsum's blacklist now. Shaking my head in an attempt to clear my thoughts running in the same direction, I set my next destination and dashed towards a small dormitory where Ishii resided. Only halfway there did the thought hit me, why am I hauling everyone myself when I have clones? No, alcohol definitely affects the ability to think clearly, even if I haven't drunk enough for real intoxication. Creating two shadow clones, I handed over the unconscious bodies to them and headed home. Hopefully, Ma won't scold too much and will give me something to eat, because right now, all I want is food and sleep. Kanade, Kanade, wake up. Ugh, was all the girl could manage to say in her half-asleep state as someone shook her shoulder. Kanade, if you don't get up right now, I'll be angry. Recognizing that familiar voice, Hyuga quickly opened her eyes and sat up in bed, ignoring her body's weak protests and worsening headache from the hangover. I'm up, I'm up, she muttered, struggling to focus her gaze and look around. Indeed, beside her bed stood her mother, Hyuga Tayumi herself, who was now disapprovingly observing her daughter. Mom! Did you really have to wake me up so early? A glance at the sky just beginning to lighten outside the window convinced the girl of the lost opportunity to sleep for at least a couple more hours before any need to get out of bed arose. Firstly, it's high time, and secondly, I want to know how your drinking binge went yesterday, the older woman frowned, but judging by your appearance and lack of signs of nocturnal activity, you didn't manage to lure Ryo. Next time you're going to try drinking half an Uzumaki half your weight and then trying to seduce a clone in a barely sane state, her daughter grumbled. Too bad, I was hoping to catch you two together and immediately grab Nara by the balls, Tayumi pursed her lips in frustration. Against her will, Kanade blushed. Kachan. Kachan what? I've been Kachan for over half a decade now. Where are my grandchildren? You've got a guy like that at your fingertips, and you don't move. I don't care about the head, but you should realize that there aren't enough geniuses for everyone. Especially if they're not handsome and characterless bastards. I've never even seen his face without a mask on, she said, rightly indignant. What do you need to be a Coogan for? If only it were that easy. He's got a lot of seals on his clothes that make it impossible to see anything. Youngsters. Henge. Suddenly, the older Hugo was replaced by a handsome boy in his early twenties with a luxuriant lock of red hair gathered in a ponytail and wearing the standard Yuzushiogaku uniform. This was exactly what his father looked like, and rumor had it Ryo was growing up to be almost a complete copy of him, having only adopted his genius brains from Nara. The technique dissipated with a small puff of smoke and the room was once again filled with a pair of women, only the older of the two rolled her eyes dreamily. If I had been younger then, without a child and free, I would definitely try to beat off such a man. And what they say about Uzumaki's stamina. It's definitely better than your weak father, who was barely strong enough for one run. Kachan. Not in front of me. At the mention of such details about her parents' private life, the girl instantly blushed to the tips of her ears. Who did you become such a modest girl? Tayumi shook her head, looking at her daughter. At your age, I've long since saddled the most enviable stallions of the clan, Ma. The younger Hugo was rapidly approaching a burgundy complexion and unsuccessfully tried to simultaneously plug her ears and cover her mother's mouth with a single glance. All right, all right, I won't do it again, the woman said, but you'll have to take more decisive steps if you want to get Nara not only in bed, but married. How much more decisive? Especially since I'm also the team sensei, which makes it more difficult. Or do you think Tsum won't notice and report it to her mother? Not to mention Umbu's interest. You were unlucky with Inazuka, but all guys are attracted to a gorgeous body, and you can't complain because you inherited my form. Well, you're gonna have to make the most of it. 
Here you showed a shoulder, they're gracefully bent over. Here it seems to be accidentally pressed breast and he is yours. Nothing complicated. And Umbu only care about his safety, not his privacy. If only it were possible to track his reaction, but even his eyes are covered with black glasses and you feel like you're talking to a stone statue, her daughter sighed. You know what, take your team to the hot springs next time, and make sure it's a mixed day. Ma? You'll show yourself off, especially against Inazuka's flat backdrop, and you'll get a good look at the merchandise, since he won't go in the water with a mask and cape on, Tayumi nodded confidently and licked her lips, adding, just remember to let me know in advance, I'm not going to miss such a spectacle. Kachan, you're almost a quarter of a century older than him. And you're acting worse than a hormonal teenager. The younger Hyuga moaned in frustration. Shut up. When you lose your virginity, then I'll look at you. What kind of girl are you? At least you inherited your figure, her mother shook her head. Anyway, if you obey me, you'll have this little guy in your pocket, or rather, in your pants, and you can count on me for that. That's what I'm afraid of, the girl sitting on the bed muttered gloomily and sighed doomfully. Ten enhanced explosive, five paralyzing, ten blinding, a couple of barriers, four sensory, and two dozen modified explosive seals, please. After counting the named seals, I stacked them neatly into a pile and wrapped them in chakra insulating paper, handing them over to another jonin and receiving a quite decent sum. Goodbye, I bid farewell with a customary bow, watching the buyer leave and returning to my interrupted task, designing new merchandise for the shop. At the same time, five clones were doing exactly the same thing, currently stationed right in the warehouse to avoid transporting them far. In general, it was another day off, most of which I spent behind the counter, allowing Saya a couple of free days. Considering the lack of a huge influx of customers, I had plenty of free time, mostly spent replenishing stocks or training chakra control and elemental transformation, unwilling to just idle away. However, such diligence had other reasons, when my mind wasn't occupied, various thoughts started swirling, sometimes leading me to somewhat unpleasant conclusions. A recent conversation with Setsura, quite concerned about my mental health, Saya had simply gotten used to my obsession with training and work to the detriment of everything else, and had even caught a bit of it herself, made me look at my actions and plan somewhat differently. From a neutral point of view, such workaholism, especially combined with constant use of shadow clones, did indeed look somewhat unhealthy even compared to seasoned veterans with their numerous quirks, let alone for a guy of my age, albeit a local, genius. Simply put, after learning more from mom about my daily schedule, Setsura became worried, a consequence of close communication with Yamanaka, and decided to rectify the situation. Naturally, without much success, but it made me think. Indeed, among all the shinobi I know from our clan and allied ones, no one has even come close to my achievements even without using clones. And these are people who devote most of their free time to self-improvement, not counting the lazy Nara. There's something to think about. And if earlier I justified it with the need for rapid strength gain without sacrificing basic quality, now that excuse no longer holds, currently, I am superior to the vast majority of Chunin and a small number of full-fledged Jonin. And this isn't just my opinion, it's Mito's assessment, whose judgment is simply undeniable. If anyone, she wouldn't lie or exaggerate my achievements to curry favor. But even this wasn't the main cause for concern. It was just somewhat unpleasant discoveries, which could be attributed to the peculiarities of the world. No, what shook me the most was something else. After a long delve into my own motivations, existing aspirations, and desires, I realized a bone-chilling fact. For such a lifestyle, more precisely, for rapid growth and development as a shinobi, I am willing to sacrifice even existing relationships with the opposite sex, let alone interactions with other acquaintances, friends, and women, including having a family, except for Saya. And this is already a pathology not even characteristic of brilliant obsessed psychos like Orochimaru. It makes one think. Fortunately, even such realization somewhat reassured me by its very fact, if I am capable of understanding and accepting all this, then perhaps I can correct it. Maybe. That's when the psychology books I read some time ago turned out to be useful. Sorting out during long meditations the roots of such a situation and its primary causes, 
I had to admit that memories of a past life and a well-established personality became the main reason. Coming from a technological world and encountering manifestations of the supernatural only on TV screens and in numerous imitators like movies, books, and games, it's quite difficult for a normal person to comprehend and accept a new reality so different from the everyday norms instilled since childhood and throughout life. Simply put, even if you're the most brilliant genius and powerful talent, you can't jump dozens of meters into the air or run freely on water and walls even after the most monstrous training. The same goes for lifting multi-ton blocks and creating firestorms with a simple breath. Spot. Of course, studying martial arts and various practices, like those studied by Tibetan monks, expands human capabilities, but where are they and where is the ordinary person, able to witness such miracles only through a screen? It doesn't inspire much confidence. Now, take this very ordinary person, albeit a bit stubborn and strong-willed, and place them in a world where what was once considered magic from fairy tales is accessible, and personal achievements depend solely on you. The possibilities for self-improvement are practically limitless and tangibly felt. The conclusions from such an action are quite obvious, though not readily apparent. In simpler terms, it's either madness with denial of an entirely foreign reality or a drug addict with a slightly leaky roof. Well, or an intermediate state, the difference isn't particularly significant. Looking back, I have to admit that my roof started leaking from the moment I gained access to chakra and made my first seals by hand. Ryota's near death confirmed the danger of this world, and the attack on the way to Yuzushiogakure only strengthened the emerging philosophy of power, quite familiar to local residents but elevated to a new height in my case, slowly but surely turning into an obsession. Knowing exactly what the local Kage and other S-class monsters were doing a quarter century ago and what will happen in the not-so-distant future only worsened the condition of my already somewhat unhealthy mind, while mastering Kage Bunshin no Jutsu brought desires into balance with available capabilities, with no major consequences for health, physical, regarding the rest it's quite clear. It's rather sad to realize the sliding of one's own roof as the conclusions are drawn, but considering it as something entirely normal and natural. And the clear attainment of results only spurs on. But the last straw that broke the camel's back, turned out to be Saya's injury, which I collected with my own hands from a bloody mess. Considering that in the past world, a person with such injuries turned into a corpse faster than drowning in a cast iron kettle, I finally turned into a maniac of self-improvement at the expense of even simple relationships with others and breaks, subsequently replacing the latter with active rest as a way to relieve accumulating tension. In all reasonableness, outside help is needed here, but I won't go to Yamanaka even under the threat of madness, let alone a small phase shift, so after prolonged brainstorming in 20 copies, me and clones, it was decided to do almost nothing. After all, it's better to have an obsession with a not-so-strong roof and dominate everyone than to end up as one of the dead losers. Besides, I haven't turned into a soulless machine over all these years, so there's no need to panic, and as for everything else. Well, a slight adjustment to my schedule should help, as well as a firm intention to spend more time with loved ones, I have enough willpower for that. Of course, in my free time, thoughts on this topic haunt me, but I try to accept them as a given. After all, I am only human and am entitled to have some weaknesses. And the thought of a small distance from madness to genius warms me. The main thing is not to have it the other way around and to pay more attention to the opinions of others, more chances to pass for a stubborn but normal shinobi. Moreover, if I realize it, then not everything is so bad. Do you take individual orders? Someone's voice distracted me from drawing a seal and contemplating. Raising my eyes, I found another jonin, who made up the bulk of customers, with the Uchiha clan mark on the left sleeve in standard shinobi gear of that rank standing before the counter. Only the handle of a sword sticking out from behind the shoulder and a thin horizontal scar above the left eyebrow, running from the middle of the forehead to the temple, stood out. A typical dark-haired and black-eyed possessor of the Sharingan, slightly over 30, but according to my sensory abilities, stronger and more experienced than the majority of Jonin seen. I had had time to learn to distinguish such people from the others. A shinobi who had lived to such an age by definition cannot belong to the gray mass. Unfortunately, no, I shook my head. What's the reason? As far as I remember, 
the Uzumaki were quite successful in taking on orders, in addition to simply selling seals, the Uchiha raised an eyebrow inquisitively. It all comes down to lack of time, I can barely keep up with replenishing the current range of seals, I informed him, shrugging. Considering my rank as a genin and the training associated with it, there simply isn't time for anything else. And the hospital work, added the jonin, grinning. Well, that too, I agreed with him, raising an eyebrow questioningly. I was among the patients, explained the Uchiha, rubbing the scar on his forehead. Who would have thought I'd survive a split skull, I would have doubted it for sure. Ah, I remember that one, I remember. It was lucky that the brain was minimally affected, and the damage could be repaired without harm to cognitive functions. I remember in the past world, people survived with bullets through their heads, and here medicine is much more advanced. What do you need from me? I asked, nodding understandingly at the man. Here. He laid out a pair of cuffs on the counter. About the width of a palm, made of simple bronze, they didn't attract attention at first glance, but they clearly contained a considerable amount of chakra. Moreover, judging by the material, they were quite ancient, no one makes cuffs from such metal nowadays. Yet they looked as if they had just come from a master's hands, no scratches. I recently cleared out my grandfather's house and found them hidden in a secret compartment, the Jonin explained. According to a note, these are Uzumaki artifacts, and my great-great-grandfather bought them from your relatives. However, after his death, no one in the family could use the cuffs, and then, obviously, they were forgotten. Hmm, you need a binding? I asked, picking up one cuff and examining it. Yes. Finding no hint of seals, I turned the ancient artifact a bit more and guessed to infuse it with some chakra. The result was immediate, numerous symbols appeared faintly in a pale blue light. Hmm, it's too complicated for me at the moment, but I can isolate the elements managing the binding to the owner, I pondered, rubbing my chin thoughtfully. I guess I'll manage in a couple of weeks. So you'll take it, the shinobi visibly rejoiced. Yes, it's an interesting challenge, so it's worth a try, I confirmed confidently, inspecting the second cuff. How much will you take? Not in money, can you provide two Raitan techniques of no less than B class? Considering my scant arsenal for this element, currently consisting of Chidori and a variation of Sanban, it was urgent to expand it. And who but an Uchiha might have Jutsu of such a rare element in Konoha, like lightning or even wind? As far as I know, for most shinobi, fire is their primary element, and water or earth the secondary, if there's any predisposition to a second at all. Considering the first world war of shinobi, they managed to nab Jutsu from IWA, most of the water getting from Uzumaki, but against Kumo they haven't been serious with all their siblings. Saya even had to come up with ways to master the lightning element just because very few people in our clan had the same element. Some Uchiha certainly distinguished themselves, but they were in no rush to share their secrets with others. And you can't even send mice to the red-eyed ones, they don't care what type of chakra they see, unlike the protective few in systems. For a simple setup? Well, no one else will take it, I shrugged, and the rest of the craftsmen will only break it. All right, deal, agreed the Jonin, I'll drop by in a couple of weeks. Deal, I said, shaking hands with the Uchiha, scooping up the cuffs from the counter and putting them away in one of the counter drawers. Glancing after him, I turned to the next visitor. I need two dozen enhanced explosive tags, a dozen paralyzing ones. Katan, Hosenka no Jutsu. Hyuga didn't waste any time and immediately started using techniques. Katan, Gokaku no Jutsu. Tsum didn't lag behind, aiming to cut off my maneuvering space and divert my attention to a third opponent. Dodging three small fireballs, I jumped aside and deflected a kunai aimed at my side with a timely thrown shuriken. Damn, it's problematic to fight against three opponents. Making sure there were no more threats from Ishii's side and he was too far away for sword techniques, I swiftly formed a couple of hand seals, simultaneously touching the seal on the inside of my cheek with the tip of my tongue and filling my mouth with water for the technique. Swaytun, Tepidama. The spit that flew out of my mouth expanded into a water sphere half my height in flight, easily extinguishing Inazuki's not-so-powerful fireball, knocking her off her feet, and embedding her into a nearby tree, effectively disabling her for a couple of minutes. Unfortunately, it didn't touch the dog. 
Usually, even a C-rank technique requires more time to create and turns out less powerful, but the very first jutsu I learned is so familiar to me that a couple of hand seals are enough, not to mention a strong predisposition to sway ton and the availability of water, instead of creating it with chakra. Megan, Narakumi no Jutsu. Ishii's attempts to catch me in a Jinjutsu for a couple of moments were unsuccessful, only my temples felt a barely noticeable warming of the skin in places where the seal was applied, but to maintain camouflage, I had to mutter, Kai, hesitating a little. During this time, Kanade managed to approach almost close enough with Kanai in hand, so I had to jump back, breaking the distance and using the only option that could provide cover and at the same time fend off the overly approaching pair. Ninpo, Dokujuri. Exhaling a dark cloud of poisonous gas, I disappeared from the sight of the enemies and took advantage of this by sequentially creating a trio of different clones. Kage Bunshin. Mizu Bunshin. Raitan Kage Bunshin. I didn't have time to do anything else because through the curtain a medium-sized fire dragon burned its way, which is Kanade's favorite attack. Without the power of recognized katan masters like Uchiha, she won due to meticulous control and the ability to manipulate jutsu even without direct eye contact with the opponent, Byakugan, damn. However, the clones will take care of that, and it's time for me to apply something more powerful to come out victorious in this unequal battle. As I quickly folded the hand seals memorized almost reflexively, I didn't forget to track what was happening around me. Suetun, Mizu Jinhiki. A large wall of water rose in the path of the fire technique, and the dragon was safely extinguished, depleting all chakra reserves. Raitun, Kengekiha. As soon as the lightning elemental clone charged, significantly reducing in size, a very familiar cry sounded from the other side, twice. She quickly recovered. Kitsuga. Hiding behind someone else's attack is a great move, just not against me or other good sensors. Crashing into the water, Tsum and Karamaru predictably shouted in pain and stopped their technique, collapsing to the ground in their usual form. However, my wall also had no intention of living long, having exhausted its strength reserve. Rotaro and Sensei, who had come closer than desired, pounced on my clones, which took a few steps forward to prevent them from quickly reaching the protected body, while the Raitan Bunshin jumped back, waiting for the completion of my technique. Naturally, the clones couldn't delay the Jonin and Chunin, not by rank, but by strength, for long, but they managed to win a few precious seconds and gave me the opportunity to finish the series of seals. Folding the last one, I spat out a powerful stream of water ahead, investing a huge amount of chakra. Swaitun, Baku Swahusha. With only 1 16th of the remaining reserve, the technique nonetheless successfully hit the attackers who didn't expect such treachery. Due to the close distance, it didn't cause much damage, and they even had a chance to surface from under the wave. However, my last clone jumped forward and dispersed, delivering an electric discharge into the water. The result was quite predictable. Kanade and her partners were lucky that there wasn't much chakra left in it after using the jutsu, Otherwise, they would have needed serious treatment. The water quickly receded from the training ground, leaving three coughing and twitching figures in the mud. To my surprise, the dog managed to escape the affected area and was now successfully hanging from a tree, using chakra. Ryo, I'll kill you. Tsum hissed, finally getting rid of the water that had hit her off guard. Cough, cough, spitting out a lump of water with grass that somehow got into his mouth, Rotaro conveyed the depth of his hatred with a single glance, but he didn't say anything, preferring to try to clean his katana smeared with mud. Unexpected outcome, Kanade spoke up, struggling to get to her feet and looking with disgust at her hair, now devoid of its tie and covered in a decent layer of mud. But the application of techniques was unexpected and effective, especially using Raitan to enhance Sutton's offensive abilities. And defensive ones too, I added. And that too, agreed Huga. Did you plan this in advance or was it improvisation? I planned it, after the last two sparrings, I studied your ways of interaction well and devised a rough plan with several variations, I explained to her. Then all that remained was to wait for the right moment and act. Since the time I started defeating even Kanade, not to mention her partners, she made it a rule to arrange battles three against one to prevent me from rusting and allow others to practice against a much stronger opponent. 
Until this time, I shamefully failed in numbers, simply unable to fend off attacks from all sides. And what's most nasty, I can only use elemental ninjutsu, kage bunshin aside, and taijutsu, otherwise I would quickly be entangled by shadows, subjected to needle stabbing or choking. Where's the justice in that? True, the fact that training seals are still on me warms my soul. And when did you manage to master Raitan? Tsum inquired, dismally examining her dirty clothes. I haven't mastered it yet, but since Sensei made it a habit to block all my Dotan techniques with Daruyu Heki, I had to worry about using the opposite element, I shrugged. We don't have anything powerful in the clan library, but even such weak techniques came in handy. I modestly omitted the fact that one of them was obtained from an Uchiha Jonin. Alright, let's clean up and call it a day, Hyuga shook her head. Ryo? Yes, yes, let's do it. Forming seals, I performed the technique. Suetun, Mizu Rappa. Dousing each of my teammates and the dog with a strong stream of water, I washed off the clinging mud and nodded satisfactorily. With the proper skill, techniques of this element can be applied not only in battle. Honestly, I wouldn't have thought to use them like this if not for Sensei's hints. However, there could have been another intention, after the impromptu shower, the clothes clung to the girl's figure very seductively, accentuating her impressive assets. Along with her occasional interest in me, it's quite possible that Hyuga has decided to open the season for hunting geniuses, albeit acting very cautiously and unobtrusively. I doubt she came up with it herself, it shows an experienced hand, and the girl doesn't stand out in this regard, and she doesn't have a boyfriend yet. Great, Kanade brushed wet hair from her face. And now, how about going to the hot springs? There's an excellent place nearby. Hmm, nearby? Isn't that where I've been before? And today happens to be a mixed bathing day. Looks like attempts to see me without a mask haven't been abandoned. I'll pass, I have plenty of other things to do today and spending a couple of extra hours on leisure would be too wasteful, I wave my hand dismissively. I also have things to do today, Tsum replied, throwing a quick glance at me. Ishii said nothing, but from the way he couldn't tear his eyes away from the figure of the wet Hyuga, I understood that someone had fallen for our mentor. Well, I wanted to do something together, like one team, the girl grumbled offendedly, but didn't stay upset for long. Then, let's reschedule our trip for another time. Goodbye, Sensei, I sighed. See you all. Turning around, I slowly headed towards the village. Ishii soon joined me, while Inazuka decided to ignore our company and sped up, rushing ahead with her dog. Well, it's her business. Tell me, Ryo, why did you really decline, my partner asked after a short silence. After all, any guy would go far to see the sensei without clothes. Are you talking about yourself? I smirked and enjoyed watching the boy blush. But the real reason is simple, I won't see anything new there, and I don't want to waste a couple of hours of free time just for that. Over the past years, I've seen hundreds of naked bodies of shinobi of both genders. That's all. I didn't bother to mention that all of them were more or less wounded, and some didn't even resemble humans much, not necessary to scare the younger generation prematurely. Well, not everyone is as advanced as you, sighed Rotaro. Shaking my head at the gloomy boy, I decided it was time to explain something to him before it was too late. If you're hoping for something with Kanade, you better leave your dreams and find someone better, I advised. Why? She's beautiful, has a great character, a strong kunoichi, and she's not that much older than me to matter, Ishii retorted. That's true, but you're forgetting one huge drawback that outweighs everything else, she's from the side branch of the Hyuga clan. And what's wrong with that? She doesn't belong to herself and will do what's beneficial for the clan and its head, so forget about your love, nothing will come of it anyway, I shrugged. Besides, there's another significant detail, all members of the side branch bear a seal on their forehead, with which any fool from the main branch can inflict excruciating pain with a simple touch or even kill if any of the side branch members disobey. But that's almost like slavery, the boy grimaced in disgust. It's the tradition of the clans, and it's not for us to change, I said solemnly. Even if you marry her, all your children will receive the same seal and will be dependent on the whims of fools from the main branch. I don't need to tell you what a person can do when they're confident in their power and impunity. Feeling a bit darkened, I remembered a couple of cases where I had to literally pull Mark Huga out of the grave, 
not because of enemies, but because of members of their own clan. And no one fights against this barbarism, he asked incredulously. To interfere in the internal affairs of such a powerful clan? Even the Hokage wouldn't do that without a very compelling reason, let alone everyone else. So think carefully and decide, do your children need such a gift, or is it better to find a girl without a Juinjutsu on her forehead? Not to mention that the sensei seems to have taken a liking to you, Ishii looked at me suspiciously. Maybe you're saying all this on purpose to get rid of a competitor? Ha, huh, I don't need such happiness anyway. I waved off, nodding to the guards at the village gate. Even if sensei wants to rope me in, it's only because the Hugo want to snatch a very promising shinobi from the Nara, not just out of love for me. Or do you think all those giggly girls at the academy hung around me solely because of my irresistible looks, and not because they were hunting for a cozy spot next to the genius or their clan's advantage? They couldn't care less about me. My partner's wide eyes clearly showed he hadn't considered my problem from this angle before, attributing his classmates' behavior to mere foolishness and admiration. We walked in silence for a while longer, weaving through the crowd, and Ishii's face showed the intense work of his thoughts. So, for the most part, clan shinobi prioritize their clan's interests first and then their own feelings? Exactly, this mostly applies to the great clans like Hyuga, Achiha, and Senju, but it's similar for strong shinobi or children from ruling clan families. I'm supposed to marry not for love, but on the clan head's directive, and they're already looking for a suitable bride for me to strengthen the Nara's position in the village's political arena. Yeah, I used to dream of being born into a clan, but now it doesn't seem like such a good idea, sighed the boy. That's life, there are quirks everywhere, and even being an orphan has its positives, though not too many, I shrugged. Get used to it, that's how it was, is, and will be. Well, thanks for sharing insights about clans, I had no idea about these details, my partner gratefully nodded. If I have questions, can I ask you? No problem, as long as it's not about clan secrets, I'll definitely answer. Anyway, you'll have to delve into all this sooner or later. After enlightening the boy a bit more about typical clan intricacies, I bid him farewell and hurried into the shop, using the rooftops for entry. Hey, Ma, how's it going? There were no customers in the shop, just Saya bored behind the counter. Boring, hardly any buyers, she perked up upon seeing me. How was your day? Same as usual, except this time I managed to handle all three of them simultaneously in the training spar, I smirked, unbuttoning my collar and pulling down my mask around my neck. So, your right on techniques came in handy, she smiled back. Exactly, slipping behind the counter, I kissed Saya on the cheek. You can go relax or do something else, I'll cover for you. Okay, I'll go prepare lunch and call you when it's done. Deal. Watching Ma leave, I adjusted my disguise and settled onto a stool, leaning on the counter and patiently waiting for customers. Since Ma and I spend more than half the day here, we had to equip it not only as a seal storage but also for living, as going to the clan quarter for lunch was too much hassle. The next few hours passed without much activity, several Jounin and a couple of Chunin dropped by for kibakufutamis, so I was about to close up shop when the jingling bell on the door stopped me. Shikaku? What are you doing here? I was surprised. Usually, my cousin just comes by for a few seals, not dragging himself here. According to him, it's too much trouble. Just stopped by for the usual sets, he sighed. Throw me sixteen pieces. Are you going to war with that horde of seals? I raised an eyebrow in surprise. And indeed to war, troublesome, Nara grimaced, our team and a few others are being sent to the front lines to relieve those currently fighting. To which front exactly? I hope not in aim. I asked anxiously, rummaging through drawers and pulling out wrapped bundles of seals. No, to the front with IWA, he waved off, it's quiet there now, so we might not even get to participate in a large-scale battle. I'll hope for that. I really don't want to bury you either, I said, laying out sixteen sets. I folded them together and wrapped them in paper, neatly tying them with a string. Here, sixteen, just as you asked. By the way, heard that Suna finally admitted defeat, Shikaku asked, counting money. Isn't that just rumors circulating for the past two months? I chuckled. No, it's not rumors anymore, it's a done deal, Sarutobi-sensei confirmed it personally. Really? 
It took them so long. Did Tsukumo finally crush them completely? I have no idea, but half of Suna's army is heading home for rest, and the Hokage and advisors are expected to be in Konoha for a while. Maybe now they'll finally rein in those fat cats. It's been exhausting pulling the wounded solely on our own skills, I complain to my cousin, medical supplies are dwindling, and the council just shrugs and says everything's going to the front. Yeah, and how are we supposed to treat them? If it weren't for our clan and the Akimichi and Yamanaka, hospital logistics would have been a disaster. Give power to the fat cats, and the mice will have a field day, Shikaku smirked, they shouldn't have let those fat cats into power in the first place. Yeah, the first Hokage made a big mistake in that regard, now we're reaping the fruits. Alright, take care, I'm off to get ready, I'll be leaving tomorrow. Be careful out there, and don't forget the standard IWA tactics. Watching my cousin wave goodbye, I sighed, now I had to worry about this trio too. I hoped this war would end soon, otherwise, I myself had solid chances of fighting in the next couple of years. Ma would definitely go crazy with worry. Not hurrying, I strolled along the deserted streets of Kanoha, occasionally noticing umbu patrols leaping across rooftops and early birds from the common folk beginning their work at such an early hour. Six in the morning was even too early for me, but Sensei's order to appear at the Hokage Tower at this time was unmistakable. Knowing she doesn't tolerate tardiness, I had to leave with some extra time just in case. So, I walked leisurely, enjoying the dawn silence, a rare pleasure for me. The closer I got to the tower, the more shinobi activity I observed, the entire administrative apparatus was under the Hokage's command for better village management and simplified security. Given that teams return at any time of day or night, the acceptance of completed contracts is conducted round the clock. Stepping out from a small alley onto the central square, I immediately noticed familiar figures propping against the wall not far from the entrance to the administrative building. Hey folks, been here long? I waved amiably, within earshot. We just got here a couple of minutes ago, Rotaro yawned widely, why do we have to gather so early? Any guesses? Maybe it's a mission with a time limit, my partner shrugged, also fighting off a yawn. Or we'll be doing work inside the walls, so the sooner we go, the sooner we'll be back. Indeed, in current times, it's better to sacrifice a night's sleep than settle down to rest in an unsafe place, he agreed, casting an envious glance at the puppy peacefully dozing under Inazuka's arm. Has Kanade-sensei shown up yet? Not yet, but she should appear soon, sighed Ishii, leaning back against the wall again and covering his eyes. Personally, I could use another hour or two of sleep, missions be damned. Can't argue with that, I nodded, judging by the newly risen light that we had at least another five minutes of relaxation. Despite the presence of clocks in this world, ranging from ordinary alarm clocks and wall clocks to wristwatches, shinobi prefer not to use the latter, determining time by the position of the sun instead. Of course, there are exceptions, but they don't last long, even the faint ticking of the smallest wristwatch can be detected by almost any chunin who enhances their hearing with chakra. Hence, they rely on this primitive method of timekeeping. The academy even develops a sense of time in its students to facilitate coordinated attacks without personal contact and the use of radios. One might think that with even basic computers, this issue would have been resolved, but there's no sign of progress yet, everyone seems content with the current state of affairs. It's an astonishingly inert society, hardly advancing in terms of everyday conveniences. It's as if modern technology were given to ancient Greeks, taught them how to use it with their fingers, but not the principles behind its operation. In other words, they were given the ability to use it but not to improve it. This situation mirrors the world of Shinobi at the moment. Of course, there are prodigies everywhere, but they're easily destroyed here, just hire a nuke Neen, and there's no one left. Those capable of defending themselves are shinobi who prefer to use their own genius for self-improvement and increasing their strength. That's how things are with cats and pies. Judging by some references in the oldest books I found in the Nara library, this situation hasn't changed since the time of Rikudo. Technologies existed, but understanding them required trial and error among uneducated aborigines. All right, everyone's here, excellent. A familiar voice behind me interrupted my rather interesting thoughts. Sensei. Why are we meeting so early? Sum exclaimed, 
peeling herself away from the wall. Turning around, I said nothing, just nodded in greeting, but also showed interest in the question asked, raising an eyebrow. I've taken on a more challenging mission for us than weeding gardens, and the sooner we leave, the better," replied Huga, dressed in a field uniform of a jonin and loaded with ammo pouches. Considering Sensei's maniacal attachment to her white clan clothes, this was already a sign of the mission's unusual nature. And considering the amount of weaponry available, we were going to kill. Who's our target? I calmly inquired, ignoring the sudden realization that my partners had come to the same conclusion. Kanade chuckled softly. Well done, Ryo, I never doubted you. As for the target, we're to destroy a bandit camp of about 60 heads, spotted yesterday by Umbu patrols. And they didn't destroy the camp themselves? Ishii was surprised, not fully grasping the gravity of the situation. Unlike him, Tsum, who had paled slightly, understood perfectly well that our trio would have to bathe in bandit blood and kill more than one person on this mission. Ambu are not obligated to do that, their task is to control the territory around Kanoha and capture enemy shinobi and strong nuke Nin capable of causing serious harm to the fire country settlements, the girl patiently explained. Eliminating bandits is considered a task for Chunin teams and experienced Jenin under the leadership of a mentor. You fit this description perfectly, and it's time for you to experience real shinobi life without any embellishments. Are there nuke Nin among the bandits? I asked. If the patrol hasn't taken care of them, there shouldn't be anything serious, but it's better to prepare for various scenarios. Two shinobi at the level of ordinary genin from other villages and one at the level of our chunin, so they're well within our capabilities. Yeah, our team isn't just three genin and a jounin, but two inexperienced chunin and two average jounin. Against a much weaker opponent, we should manage without losses, especially in the case of a surprise attack. Then what are we waiting for? I stretched my shoulders and cracked my neck, signaling full combat readiness. Inside, anticipation slowly awakened, it was time to test the skills acquired through so much training and self-improvement, in a real battle. Not that fights with Mito-chan or invited friends from Canada were vastly different, but the awareness of our own safety, even in the worst-case scenario, greatly helps. If everyone has their spare equipment with them, we can set out, nodded our sensei. Silently presenting scrolls pulled from pockets, for better mobility on our first journey outside the village, we followed Huga. How far do we need to go to reach our destination? Sum asked. According to the Umbu report, the camp is an hour's run away, so for us, that's approximately two and a half hours, maybe three if we conserve energy, answered our sensei. You've outgrown ordinary genin now and shouldn't have much trouble with a short journey at a fast pace. So follow me. If we're lucky, we'll catch the camp sleeping, making our mission to eliminate them even easier. Turning, Kanade ran towards the eastern service gates, and we followed her. Since there were already enough people on the streets, we had to leap onto roofs and sprint across them towards the village's exit. After a couple of minutes, our team signed out with the duty chunin and ran through the open space between the village walls and the forests, diving into it without paying attention to the road. The Fire Country's forest can hardly be called ordinary, even with a very large stretch, as it more resembles a park. Let it be a park with simply gigantic trees, whose branches are ideal for shinobi movement, but still a park. No thickets, tangled undergrowth, or anything like that. Of course, we haven't traveled far from Kanoha yet, but I doubt other countries have the same vegetation. Well, except for the land of forests, where the Senju supposedly originated. If this is Hashirama's work, he solved several problems at once, starting with providing advantageous terrain for local shinobi and ending with various economic perks for the country as a supplier of unique wood. Of course, it's a little scary at first to climb to heights of dozens of meters, jumping from branch to branch, but after moving across rooftops, you quickly get used to it. After a while, Huga signaled us to form a marching order with me at the rear, partners on the sides, and her in front, providing a very good view of the beautiful long legs of the kunoichi, tightly wrapped in fabric and firm buttocks. Hmm, time to visit Mito. With some difficulty tearing my gaze away from the tempting sight, I focused on the surrounding environment. If I don't distract myself urgently, running will become very uncomfortable, 
even if such a faux pas won't be noticed from the outside thanks to the cloak. Automatically noting an umbu ninja moving some distance behind us, I return my thoughts to a rather interesting topic. The progress of the shinobi world. After sifting through heaps of books, diaries, and historical works in the library, it must be acknowledged that it is precisely the shinobi who are the cause of the halt in progress in this world. At least, this can be said specifically about technological progress. Even during the times of clan wars, which lasted for quite a long period, several hundred years, there wasn't much time for science amid constant clashes between clans. The common people here are at least surviving, not engaging in science. The daimyo are occupied with maintaining their own territories and certainly won't fund research. Trade doesn't thrive much in such conditions, even with relatively peaceful coexistence among shinobi entities. That's regarding technological progress. Continuous war leads not only to its decline but also to the improvement of weaponry. In this world, the most powerful weapon is human. It's quite natural that under such conditions, monsters like the first Kage emerge. Even the most numerous clans cannot deploy many people, so the strength of each shinobi affects the survival of those around them. Constant battles and self-improvement contribute to the creation of the strongest fighters. In other words, personal development was prioritized above all else. After the formation of hidden villages, the situation changed somewhat, with the accumulation of meat during periods of relative peace, war shifted from individual clashes of a few shinobi to large-scale battles. Personal development gradually lost its previous significance, as even the strongest could be overwhelmed by sheer numbers. With the emergence of such shinobi and relative calm between countries, trade flourished. However, prolonged wars continued to stifle technological progress for the same reasons as before. Adding to this the general distrust among people, the habit of secrecy, and the ability to eliminate competitors, stagnation, and sometimes regression, in scientific development ensued, as occasionally even the sole bearers of knowledge were destroyed. As long as periods of peace between countries do not extend beyond a couple of decades, any dreams of scientific and technological progress are futile. Given the nature of shinobi, this is hardly possible. Perhaps one of the hidden villages might dominate all others, but preceding this would be centuries of warfare that would set back advancements by hundreds of years. In principle, what use is such development if the outcome ends up like in the past world? A mediocre shinobi can be likened to a tank in terms of potential destruction, while the strongest is akin to a missile launcher. However, the final outcome differs in consequences. Even if someone like Madara levels several mountains and forests, a few years later, the area will again be teeming with greenery. In contrast, after an artillery bombardment, little can grow in the polluted environment. Even the impact of a meteorite, something only the strongest few in history could achieve, doesn't match the aftermath of an atomic or hydrogen bomb explosion. So as long as Chakra and those who wield it exist, the arms race will continue in this direction, safeguarding the planet's atmosphere from the fate of my past world. Indeed, even the most potent poisons created in sand and grass originate from plants rather than chemicals. Even the deadliest chakra from the strongest bijou mainly harms living beings but leaves the land bare without life. It's for the best, really. Lost in thought, time flew by unnoticed, and after two hours, we found ourselves near the bandit camp, which had yet to awaken. Only the guards remained alert, whom we easily detected and circumvented thanks to Kanade's Byakugan. Well, our first serious mission is about to begin. Upon surveying from the tallest trees around the bandits' temporary camp, it immediately became clear that among their leaders were individuals with brains. The location was chosen considering the mobility of shinobi and excluding stealthy attacks from above, which leaf shinobi love to conduct on competitors unfamiliar with such terrain. The size of the clearing between the forest giants also ruled out attacks by techniques from under the cover of trees. To achieve this, one would have to venture into the open area, falling within the sight of the camp sentries. Considering there were no nearby bushes for cover, it was the correct tactical approach. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.